I invite the member for Abbotsford South to lead the House in prayer or reflection. Thank you, Honourable Speaker. I would like the members of this House to take a moment and reflect as we absorb the beauty of this day that we be thankful. We be thankful for the bounty that this province provides us and that we are united in our effort to beat this pandemic. I ask for wisdom and grace and temperance as we meet today, and I ask this in the name of whomever your creator may be. So help me God. Introduction by members, opposition house leader. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. As we head into the busy estimates time uh, in this chamber and in other houses in, in the building, we all know how, how much we rely on our staff, our researchers, our communication staff uh, to do the great work to support us in the job on behalf of all the citizens of British Columbia. And today I want to take just a moment to recognize uh, in the gallery today, we have some of those hardworking, dedicated staff uh, for our caucus. We have Sean Roberts, who has been born and raised in Victoria and is a local entrepreneur. David De Deckel Logan. He grew up in East Van, but he's moved to Victoria since 2016. Abigail Uher, she moved to Victoria in 19, in fact, started at university at age 16, a very talented young woman. Stephanie Marshall White, who is a big ALS advocate and has lived in Victoria since 2018. Marissa Olson started with us in 2014 and actually in her spare time works in a group home. Uh, Ryan Mitten, who started working with us since 2016 and he graduated from the London School of Economics and is a Model UN alumnus. Andrew Reeve, who for the past three years has been a chair of a nonprofit that provides transitional housing and life skills programming to youth at risk of homelessness. And Sam Arno Burgess, he wanted to work in politics because his grandfather, who started as a political writer, became a Swedish ambassador to countries all over the world. Mr. Speaker, these young people do great work on our behalf. Their, their tireless and dedicated work is very appreciated. And I would ask the host, uh, please uh, make welcome our talented group of 20 to 39 year old kids from the basement. Member for Richmond North Centre. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. It is with heavy heart that I just learned of the passing of my friend and the renowned Chinese literary painter, Mr. Johnson Shishin Chao. The 99-year-old artist who came to Vancouver four decades ago is widely known for his passion in the classics, poetry, calligraphy, landscape and bird and flower ink painting. He is also the founding president of the Chinese Canadian Artists Federation. My thoughts and prayers are with his family, his students and his friends. Thank you. Madam Clerk. Introduction of bills. Minister of uh, Municipal Affairs. Mr. Speaker, I have the honour to present a message from Her Honour, the Lieutenant Governor. Her Honour, the Lieutenant Governor transmits herewith Bill No. 10 and 212, Municipal Affairs Statutes Amendment Act 2021, and recommends the same to the Legislative Assembly. Minister. Move that the bill be introduced and read a first time now. I'm pleased to introduce Bill 10. This bill amends the Community Charter, the Local Government Act, the Municipalities Enabling and Validating Act No. 4, and the Vancouver Charter. Local governments have been on the front lines of this pandemic, providing people in their communities with the supports and services that they need to stay safe and keep their families together. This bill proposes amendments that will help them continue to serve the people by ensuring local governments have the authorities they need to effectively govern their communities through COVID-19 pandemic response and recovery. The pandemic has taught us a lot about what really matters to British Columbians, including giving people access to the business of their local government, regardless of the circumstances. If passed, these amendments will provide permanent authorities to enable local governments to hold electronic meetings and electronic public hearings with specific transparency requirements. 
These amendments will be brought into force by regulation later once circumstances related to the pandemic have eased. The proposed amendments would also provide continuing legal effect for the unique one-time local government financial measures and the corresponding repayment obligations which were authorized in 2020 due to the pandemic. This will move the authorities from a ministerial order into a more permanent legislative framework so those authorities can wind down as originally intended. They will add new ministerial regulation authorities to enable the minister to address urgent and unique local government financial challenges and election-related matters in special circumstances. They'll remove some operational barriers for improvement districts, which were highlighted during the pandemic. And lastly, the amendments will expand eligibility for mail ballot voting by removing legislated restrictions around who is permitted to vote by mail ballot in local elections, including by-elections. Local governments have demonstrated their adaptability and their resilience in continuing to effectively lead their communities throughout the challenging circumstances presented in the pandemic. These amendments build on those experiences and they ensure sufficient authorities for local governance operations as well as financial and election matters are in place as we look ahead. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Members, have those who are participating, please have your voting cards ready. The question is the first reading of the bill. All those in favor indicate aye. aye. Those who oppose, motion carried. Minister. I have to remember what to say, <laughs> which I didn't bring. Uh, Mr. Speaker, I move that the bill be placed on the orders of the day for second reading at the next sitting of the House after today. Members, you heard the motion. All those in favor indicate aye. Aye. Those who oppose, motion carried. Madam Clerk. Statements by members. Member for Richmond North Centre. I rise today to pay tribute to a former constituent of mine and a beloved community member, Mr. Mo Kwong Lam, dearly known as MK. MK was born in Shanghai and raised in Hong Kong. There he met Marianne Lee and they were married at St. John's Cathedral in 1979. They had their son Jason in 1982 and the family emigrated to Vancouver in 1993. MK welcomed his grandson Jake in 2017. No matter how busy his work could be, he would always take his wife, son, daughter-in-law and grandson with him to travel to different places. Those who know MK well know that he liked to be among people. He was forthright, generous, and treated others with sincerity. As a result, he had made many good friends. Brothers and sisters at church call MK by name in Chinese meaning boss or big brother as a gesture of endearment. MK was also a talented businessman. Upon emigrating to Vancouver, he founded the JBC Truffle Alliance of Canada and had been serving as a CEO of the group. He was also enthusiastic about charitable and social services, having served as the president and as a council member of the Vancouver Cafe Lions Club and a council member of the BC Chinese Business Development Association. Looking back at MK's life, it was full of wonderful chapters. Sadly, in the company of his family in Richmond Hospital, he departed peacefully on April the 5th at the age of 69. My heart goes out to his family and to our community who have lost a great leader and community advocate. I ask all the members of this house to join me in sharing my deepest condolences to MK's family, friends and community. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Member for Langley East. Honorable Speaker, thank you for the opportunity to rise in the House today to tell you about a wonderful organization in my community. The Langley Sustainable Agriculture Foundation, or LSAF, is a nonprofit organization that was founded by nine local volunteers in 2011. The township of Langley has a land mass of 122 square miles, with over 75% within the agricultural land reserve. Through workshops and other initiatives, LSAF brings together farmers, academics, government officials, and other passionate individuals to strengthen food and farming in the Langleys, 
and neighboring communities. Under the guidance of board members Dave Melanchuk, Ava Reeve, Nancy Clark, Carol Paulson, Miles Lamont, Gary Jones, Emma Bryce, and John Schultons, they work hard to educate the public on farming, increase public awareness of the importance of agriculture, encourage support of local food production, and educate and encourage sustainable land and stewardship practices. One example of the fantastic work this organization has undertaken includes the Langley Ecological Services Initiative, a pilot project which works with local farmers to protect and enhance natural areas on their land. Now in its third year of operation, 11 farmers along the Bertand Creek are participating. The Langley Ecological Services Initiative is the first program of its kind on BC's west coast to reward farmers for maintaining eco-friendly areas on their lands. Such practices can be costly, and the Ecological Services Initiative was created to help farmers bear the cost of keeping waterways, forests, and other ecologically sensitive areas clean and healthy for current and future generations. Our community is fortunate to have such passionate volunteers dedicated to promoting, educated, and educating, and improving agriculture and its stewardship. Thank you. Member for Kamloops, South Thompson. All across British Columbia, in cities, towns, and villages, community spirit doesn't just happen. Instead, it is built over time by dedicated, selfless residents who are determined to be difference makers in the communities they call home. Today, I would like to introduce uh, everyone in the chamber to one such individual in the village of Chase, Mr. Roland Phillips, a retired Canadian Forces veteran who absolutely embodies the spirit of service to others. Born on Prince Edward Island, Roland, who is affectionately known as Roly, will be celebrating his 85th birthday on May 28th. After joining the Queen's Own Rifles in 1954, Roly went on to a distinguished military career serving our nation as an airborne pilot and parachuter. He also served on several dangerous but critical peacekeeping missions until his discharge in 1980 while posted in Chilliwack. But even after Roley and his wife of 63 years, Dolores, left Chilliwack for chase, the man refused to slow down, becoming active in the local branch of the Royal Canadian Legion, where his natural leadership skills were put to good work. In fact, he even took on the role of Sergeant at Arms at the Chase Legion. Known for his regular visits with shut-in veterans, Roley's devotion and care for veterans extended to spouses and dependents while he presided over the color party for the funerals and memorials of many veterans. His commitment to community service extended to the Chase Lions Club and the Chase Christmas Hamper Program where he often delivered many hampers personally year after year. In 2002, his dedication to public service was recognized when he was named the Chase Citizen of the Year. Mr. Speaker, it's been said that volunteers don't necessarily have the time, but they do have the heart. And for Roland Roly Phillips of Chase, truer words have never been spoken. Roly, happy 85th birthday, my friend, and thank you for the very positive difference you've made in the lives of so many others. Member for Chilliwack, Kent. Thank you, Honourable Speaker. I am honoured to speak today once again about amazing people in Chilliwack, Kent. Ten years ago, Zishan Anguli, as her friends call her, came to Canada from Pakistan, and they chose Chilliwack to call home two years later. They live in the promontory area of Chilliwack, Kent, with their three children, and we are incredibly lucky to have this family as part of our community. At the beginning of the pandemic, they noticed a difficulty for some with grocery shopping. They offered their time, free of charge, on weekends to shop for others, started making deliveries, and were overwhelmed not only by the need, but also by gratitude and offers to help. The community came together over Facebook, and soon they had a community of over 50 volunteers and donors and formed the Kindness Change Chilliwack Association, or KCCA. KCCA is 100% volunteer, and not a single dollar is diverted from project goals. Projects like seniors outreach, garbage cleanups in the Chilliwack River Valley and downtown Chilliwack, and meal deliveries to individual homes as well as a local shelter, most recently for Easter and Ramadan. And the list goes on. Their motto is serve the community we live in. 
and the family of volunteers that is KCCA are making our community a better, friendlier, kinder, and more generous place to be, thanks to their hard work and contributions, including from local businesses. Even during these difficult times, donors and businesses like Fresh Slice Garrison and Pablo Curry House have made it possible for hundreds of meals to be delivered to people who need them free of charge. Honourable Speaker, I was inspired when I saw this work, and even more so when I had the chance to speak with the family who started it all. And I want to acknowledge and share for the record the names of those who work as directors of this grassroots organization that does so much. President and Executive Director Zishan Khan, and Board of Directors Gulruk Zishan, Rashida Rana, Shireen Khan, Umar Farooqi, Tariq Yaqub, and Salman Rania. I would ask the House to please join me in applauding their good works. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Leader of the Third Party. Thank you, Honourable Speaker. In March of this year, seven streets in the city of Duncan's downtown core underwent a process of reconciliation. The seven streets were issued Hokuminam names in addition to their English names. The Hokuminam Signage Project is a collaboration between the Downtown Duncan Business Improvement Association, Cowichan Tribes, and the City of Duncan. The names in Hokuminam, with their English translations, are Huwain Sheth for First Street, Swatsali Sheth for Second Street, Smayakwa Sheth for Third Street, Thathikat Sheth for Fourth Street, Hualmo Sheth for Government Street, Lilut Sheth for Station Street, Khan Sheth for Canada Avenue. Amanda Vance, Executive Director of the Downtown Duncan BIA, said that the project has been a great success. She said it was a good news story for the community during the pandemic, and it was great to see the community get involved. For example, Alexander Elementary School students recorded saying the street names to help people, like me, learn how to pronounce them. Couch and Tribe's Chief Seymour said of the project, we've been looking at reconciliation for a long time. I've been looking since I've been chief to work together with my neighbor governments. It's a big step recognizing the names. The city of Duncan's Mayor Michelle Staples said, this project is something we're actually moving towards because we recognize that this should have been done in the beginning. Merle Seymour, a Cowichan Tribes elder and project participant, described how he was so honored to see the Hulkaminam signs on our streets. He said, this really uplifts our people. These signs are a wonderful step for our community to recognize we are on Cowichan lands. Haichka. Member for Port Moody, Kukurtlam. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. It's inspiring to me when I see young people step forward to make a difference. And there is one particular group of young people that I'd like to talk about today, and that's Ms. Leslie's grade 12 social justice class at Dr. Charles Best Secondary School. Ms. Leslie describes the nature of her class as not only educating students about inequities in our society, but empowering them to advocate for change. She says, I want my students to know that they have a voice, that it matters, and that people will listen. Indeed, they do have a voice, and it is being heard. I first became aware of their social justice efforts when I was copied on a letter writing campaign to change the name of the Patella Bridge. The class also embarked on the Red Dress Project to create dialogue around the issue of murdered and missing Indigenous women and girls. The dresses are red because it's believed that that's the only color that can be seen in the spirit world so that the missing can find their way back. The class collaborated with another teacher, Amanda Roberts, at Port Moody Secondary School, and many businesses and MLA offices, including my own, displayed red dresses last week. The class's efforts were covered by the media as far away as Ottawa, and Judge Buller even reached out to congratulate them on their efforts. Providing cell coverage along the Highway of Tears is just one step we are taking to address this issue. As one student in the class, Naveed, expressed, the young people, the next generation, demand change. And to Naveed I say change 
is possible. And you are part of the change. So I want to thank you and your class and your teacher for being champions for these very important issues. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Madam Clerk. Oral questions by members. Leader of the official opposition. Well, thank you, Mr. Speaker. In December, when we asked the Premier to actually do something to save major tourism destinations, his tourism minister said, and I quote, we're going to move quickly. In March, we asked again, and this time it was the jobs minister who said, and I quote, the Minister of Tourism has been engaging with them, and I suspect she'll have more to say on that very soon. We've been engaging with them for months now, end quote. So it was a bit of, bit of a shock many months later to hear this week that the Minister of Tourism still has no plan. And I quote, it's not baked. We're working out those details right now, end quote. We asked for specific details about the $100 million in funding that's been set aside. We wanted to know specifically how much is set aside for major attractions, who qualifies, and how much they could actually receive. Pretty basic questions for a $100 million fund that was announced with much fanfare. The minister didn't know and once again told struggling tourism operators and facilities across British Columbia they had to wait some more. So perhaps today the Premier could get up and he could actually provide us, and more importantly tourism operators across British Columbia, with some specific answers to those very basic questions. Minister of Tourism, Arts, Culture and Sports. Thank you, Honourable Speaker, and I uh, thank the member opposite for uh, raising this important question. Uh, we recently completed our budget estimates, and uh, the critic for this file had also asked similar questions. I did say that uh, good news is coming, that the program is being developed as we speak, and uh, good news is going to be coming to the sector. Uh, this, is, this was an important announcement, part of Budget 2021 recognizing a call to action to support iconic uh, anchor attractions throughout British Columbia. The work is being done by the public service and good news should be coming very shortly. Thank you, Honorable Speaker. Leader of the official opposition on a supplemental. Well, thank you very much. And I, I'm not sure how that brings any degree of comfort at all to businesses who are clinging to hold on in British Columbia. Good news is coming. We want, and so do tourism operators, specific answers to basic questions. Tourism operators and major att attractions cannot operate without support. They have lost millions of dollars. Let's just take one of them, Barkerville, for example, which, of course, the Premier has stood in this legislature and been a very big fan of. Well, I'm not sure he's aware that Barkerville, for example, is responsible for $25 million in economic activity. It welcomes more than 70,000 visitors every single year. And now they are facing a significant budget shortfall. When asked about Barkerville in, in the tourism estimates, the minister, again, had no answers except to say this, and I quote, Barkerville is on my to-do list, end quote. Well, she absolutely, she may not have the opportunity to actually visit Barkerville because it may close permanently if she doesn't step up and do something to help them. So let's try it again. It's a very simple question. British Columbians expect this government and premier, when they make an announcement about a big fancy program, Maybe they should provide the details at the same time. We've been waiting since December to get an answer from this tourism minister. So let's be clear, straight up, who can apply? What organizations can actually apply for funding? How much are they eligible for? Simple question, let's hope we get an answer. Minister of Tourism. Thank you, Honorable Speaker. Uh, so first of all, um, when the member talks about December, one of the first things that we did was respond to a call to action from the Tourism Task Force that our Premier appointed, uh, led by industry experts, 
who asked us to get grants out the door, which we've done to support the industry, the Indigenous Tourism BC organization to get grants out the door to invest in uh, infrastructure, which was a major call to action from the industry. And in fact, Honourable Speaker, uh, Barkerville got dollars to, through the Community Economic Recovery Infrastructure Program, upwards of $600,000. So we are deeply committed to supporting anchor attractions. And for the record, if the member opposite wants to talk about her interest in saving Barkerville, let's go back to the transcripts of 20. 2001, when the former government, the BC Liberals, turned their back on their interest of protecting heritage sites. Members, like let's listen to the answer. Doing the work. Members, doing the work and order. Minister Wade. Members of the opposition, when the minister is answering on Zoom, the minister can't hear you, so save your energy, please. Next question. Member for Richmond North Centre. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. We are 15 months into the pandemic, and the minister promised to move quickly six months ago. So the key word is quickly. So this grant to the major attraction should have been announced yesterday instead of asking us to waiting for the good news. They are dying every day. Premier and the minister, the premier has botched it. This week, the minister said, I quote, the best analogy I can give is that the ink is still wet, end quote. People in the tourism sector are drowning in red ink and have been waiting and waiting and hoping that major attraction would get support. The PNE is asking for 8 million in aid or it could close forever. To the Premier, will the PNE get support as a major attraction and employer of British Columbians? Minister of Tourism. Thank you, Honourable Speaker. Of course, these iconic attractions are vital uh, to British Columbians. Uh, when the member speaks about the PNE, of course, this is a place that I've gone to for generations, and I expect that the PE is going to be there for future generations. We are in the middle of a health crisis. We recognize that there is a call to action from the industry to support anchor attractions. I said to the member opposite during estimates, Honorable Speaker, that the program is being developed as we speak and that good news is coming. In fact, what I said on the record was within a couple of of weeks. The ministry is working as quickly as possible to develop the programs. We can get the money out the door, grants, not loans, to uh, iconic anchor attractions that have been deeply impacted uh, by this global pandemic. Thank you, Honourable Speaker. Member for Richmond North Centre and Supplemental. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The minister keeps saying that it's going to be announced in a couple of weeks. The major attractions are dying. They cannot wait for one more day. Why couldn't this be announced together with the budget? I don't understand. This pandemic has been going on for more than a year. The PNE provides 4,300 direct jobs, 9,500 indirect jobs, and 200 million in economic activity. But the fair's debt could reach 15 million by the end of the year. Laura Balance of the PNE says, I quote, Every day we go deeper into debt, and at some point it becomes unsurmountable, end quote. But the Premier appears too incompetent to care about the PNE or attraction like the Williams Lake Stampede and the Richmond Night Market in my riding. The question to the Premier once again, I hope he will stand up and respond. Will the Premier save this attraction or will they close forever? Minister of Tourism. Thank you, Honorable Speaker. Of course, we care about these anchor attractions. Of course, we care about tourism. And this is why we've, we've rolled out over $100 million out the door to su support the tourism sector. 
when the member opposite is talking specifically about the peony, the peony is owned by the municipality. We are working with the PE and the municipality and the federal government, who also announced a billion dollars in their budget a day before our budget, setting aside money for events and festivals and anchor attractions. We are doing this work together, um, member. It is important that we do the work together, but we do recognize that they have suffered because they can't have events, they can't have large crowds. We, we recognize the pandemic impacts the people industry. And that is why good news is coming in days to support the sector. It's a call to action. I'm proud of the public service for the work that they're doing. Good news is coming on the member. Thank you for the question. Leader of the third party. Thank you, Honourable Speaker. Yesterday, my colleague asked the Minister of Mental Health and Addictions if she would resist pressure to bring back flawed legislation from last summer. What we need to see from this government is that it takes the steps that health experts, scientists, researchers, advocates, and their own provincial health officer have been calling for for years in order to reduce the number of people dying from an illicit and toxic drug supply, decriminalize drug users, and ensure there is a regulated and accessible safe supply. In fact, the BC Centre for Disease Control released an evidence review that states, quote, Detention-based services are contrary to best public health practices in BC. They do not address illicit drug toxicity that is driving deaths. There's a lack of evidence that they are effective. They may result in post-release harm, including death, and that involuntary hospitalization increases stigma and reduces the likelihood of people seeking health care. My question, Honourable Speaker, is to the Premier. What does he propose to address the significant concerns with involuntary care expressed by the Chief Coroner, the Representative for Children and Youth, the Union of BC Indian Chiefs, the First Nations Leadership Council, and the BC Centre for Disease Control? Minister of Mental Health and Addictions. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Uh, thank you to the member for uh, raising the question and uh, reaffirming what we're all feeling. There's nothing more important than protecting children, particularly the loss of young, such young lives to the toxic drug supply on Vancouver Island these past few weeks. Uh, just puts that much more importance on the work that we're doing to expand voluntary care uh, for youth in uh, mental health and addiction distress, um, and to work across the spectrum on decriminalization, on safe supply, on a historic expansion and historic investment on the part of the um, British Columbia taxpayer in mental health and addiction support. Um, almost 100 million of that going specifically toward children and youth. Uh, we're working across the spectrum. And, and when we revisit uh, the lessons learned from Bill 22 and, um, and work uh, because we continue to hear parents say that stabilization care post uh, after an overdose is an important consideration and one of the tools that we want to have available as a last resort. Um, we will continue to reaffirm that it will not be a, um, a criminal issue. It will not be a, um, anything to do with the justice system. Uh, stabilization care when it comes back to this legislation uh, will remain part of the healthcare response to a tragedy that has um, affected young people in British Columbia. Leader of the third party on a supplemental. Uh, thank you, Honourable Speaker, and thank you to the Minister for her response. Uh, unfortunately, it's not just the tragic death of children, it's six British Columbians a day who are dying from a toxic drug supply. It's thousands of lives that have been lost. The minister says that this bill will be coming back, but the BC Centre for Disease Control presents an evidence-based argument against involuntary care. They say, quote, there is little to no evidence to support compulsory treatment for substance use disorders in general and for youth in particular. 
Compulsory treatment is associated with relapse, higher levels of mental duress, homelessness, and overdose, according to the BC CDC. People, especially young black, indigenous, and people of color, are less likely to seek help when they need it following involuntary care. The trauma they endure in the healthcare system is significant, and involuntary care may perpetuate that. My question, honorable speaker, is to the Minister of Mental Health and Addictions. The Premier and now she have signaled that involuntary care is a priority for this government. How is the Minister planning to address the concerns described by the BC Centre for Disease Control, and why doesn't she do what experts are asking for and immediately expand access to regulated safe supply in order to save lives? Minister of Mental Health and Addictions. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Uh, the work that British Columbia is doing to expand safe supply as a way to separate people from the toxic poison drug supply that is killing so many British Columbians, tragically, is, is continuing. It is leading the country. Uh, and we are, are working as hard as we can to continue to break new ground. Uh, the 400 percent um, increase in number of people that have been connected by their doctors or primary prescribers to connect people with safe supply uh, over the last year is encouraging and there is more to do. Let me be clear though about what was proposed in Bill 22 and some of the conversations that we will have across uh, British Columbia before that, in, that legislation um, or some form of it is reintroduced. It is uh, not the secure care that the opposition has been proposing um, and what exists in places like Alberta. It is not forced treatment. It, is, it does not involve the police. Uh, it's, um, it is a stabilization post-youth overdose uh, for a short period where there is an opportunity to connect young people uh, after they have stabilized with an option for care. Uh, that was the proposal made by my friend and predecessor to this legislature last summer. It did not have the support of the opposition parties. Um, and so our work right now is to build out voluntary care, which is badly needed in British Columbia. We have done a lot, there is more to do, and I look forward to the broad conversations that will inform next steps. Member for Kamloops, South Thompson. Oh, well, thank you very much, uh, Mr. Speaker. Um, audio visual by Lee's Music in Kamloops uh, had 30 employees. Uh, today they have six. Uh, their revenue is down 80%. As small business owner Mike Miltmore says, and I quote, we desperately need to hold on to our technicians as it takes a long time to train these guys. You can't just go, uh, go to school to be an AV tech. Uh, we need support to keep these staff on and also a plan moving forward. With many of our events permanently closed, the calendar is looking bleak, end quote. Mr. Speaker, Lee's Music does not qualify for the Circuit Breaker Grant. They've had to sell equipment, uh, taking hundreds of thousands of dollars out of their savings, savings that no longer exist, just to survive. So my question to the Premier is this, will the Premier fix the circuit breaker grant so that live event businesses that have been shut down during the pandemic are eligible for desperately needed support? Minister of Jobs and Economic Recovery. Thank you, Honourable Speaker, and uh, thank you to the member for this question. Uh, no doubt this pandemic has been a uh, challenging time for many businesses, many tourism operators, uh, and uh, we are proud that we've got the highest per capita supports for businesses and people uh, in the country. Uh, I know that all the members in this chamber uh, in the legislature should be proud of that because we all uh, are working on this together. And the member knows that uh, businesses are available uh, or have funds available right now for them. Uh, uh, they can apply for the small and medium-sized business recovery grant program, which is um, up to $30,000 and up to $45,000 if they're tourism operators. Uh, happy if the member brings uh, that particular business uh, to my office. Uh, many of his colleagues have come forward with specific businesses that have been impacted, and we've been able to navigate and support many of them. And so I uh, look forward to having that conversation after question period. Member for Campbell, South Thompson on a supplemental. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Mr. Speaker. Well, we're 16 months into this pandemic. There, there, there are, are businesses and their workers all over the province that continue uh, to, to struggle 
wondering what the future is, is going to look like. In fact, one out of, out of seven businesses in BC are at risk of closing. That's 25,000 businesses and 300,000 workers. Mr. Speaker, uh, sectors all over this province uh, are, are flapping in the wind, while the Premier trips over his shoelaces, unable to push grants and su direct supports out the door. And the Minister, the Premier, and the government continues to say, uh, to, to, to say that, that, they're, that this government is number one in supports. That is not true. This government is actually number eight in the country. This government is number eight in providing direct relief and supports to business. Ontario spends three times uh, as much as British Columbia. So let's try this again. The event, the live event industry is literally in a state of emergency. These businesses have been completely shut down due to the health measures. And most have seen their revenue decline by 80, 90, in some cases close to 100%. It doesn't make sense that businesses impacted by these health orders don't qualify for the Premier's support programs. As Tim Lang of ProShow Audiovisual says, and I quote, we are the people and businesses that enable all the conventions, concerts, conferences, business luncheons, awards galas, and ceremonies. We are the people that work unseen, behind the scenes, and unfortunately, when, when we now need government to see us, they do not. We feel absolutely invisible, abandoned, and unvalued." End quote. So the question, again, to the Premier is this. Will the Premier provide the desperately needed support that the live events sector needs to survive? Minister of Jobs and Economic Recovery. Uh, thank you, Honourable Speaker. And again, I'll remind the member that we do have the highest per capita supports. And I think the member um, uh, may uh, not know this, but Ontario has more than three times the population of BC. Uh, and so when he talks about that, the fact that they have three times our support and they have members uh, more than three times. In simple math, Honourable Speaker, I'm happy to share more details with the member. After. Members come to order. Minister will continue. Uh, yes, as I was saying, uh, Honourable Speaker, I'm happy to share the math with him. In fact, he's cited many times uh, reports that have sh highlighted uh, that uh, we have the highest per capita supports in this in the country. And we're proud of that, Honourable Speaker. Uh, again, this uh, member has raised uh, small businesses in this uh, chamber for his own political purposes. Uh, we've actually reached out to many of the businesses that he's named. Uh, and actually got them the opportunity to apply for small business recovery grant programs. Uh, the member mentioned a small business in uh, Comox, which we were able to reach out to and say, did you know that you could apply? And so, uh, and they didn't know that they could, and we were able to get them uh, in the door to apply. And so, Honorable Speaker, again, uh, happy if this member wants to bring the business names forward. We're happy to work with many businesses we can. We're proud uh, of our supports. And we're proud that we're at 99.1% of pre-pandemic job levels on our speaker. And we're going to continue that good work uh, as we come out of the pandemic. Member for West Vancouver, Capilano. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. And respectfully, uh, the minister is wrong. Um, BC does not have the highest per capita or the highest support for business. It is actually number eight. Ontario is spending three times as much per capita than BC is on its grant program. The minister is using outdated CCPA report that relies on loans and uh, federal support payments to make these claims. Um, Chris Briere of Briere Productions has written over 60 six zero letters and met with both the uh, member for Maple Ridge Pitt Meadows and the, Ma and the member for Maple Ridge Mission but has received none of the support he's requested. He says, and I quote, we're denied the BC Circuit Breaker Relief Grant that applies to bars and gyms, but not the live events sector. And uh, he's already had a circuit breaker since March of 2020. Will the Premier fix the grant program and provide some of the desperately needed funds for the live events sector? of jobs and economic recovery. 
Uh, thank you, Honorable Speaker. And uh, uh, again, we do have the highest per capita supports in this country. We're really proud of that. Uh, uh, reports have confirmed it. Uh, outside reports have confirmed it. Uh, and sorry if I don't rely on uh, the numbers the BC Liberals provide uh, on that. Uh, I would also highlight, Honorable Speaker, that British Columbians have done uh, the, the work that's needed to keep the, the numbers uh, relatively low. We haven't had to go into severe lockdowns that Ontario has had to do because of that. That work and so we continue to encourage the public to do what we need. The Minister of Health has been clear. Uh, Dr. Henry has been clear. We need people to register. We need people to get vaccinated so that we can see the economy open up and continue to see uh, a strong economic recovery. Uh, if there are businesses that need supports for applying for the Small Business Recovery Grant Program, uh, I'm happy for them to bring them forward. Again, it's up to $45,000 for businesses. Uh, and, uh, and that just touches on only a small portion of the supports that are available on our Speaker. The members opposite, of course, will know that we also have um, tax credits for employees. Honorable Speaker. Finish it, please. Oh, uh, we also have tax credits for hiring and rehiring employees. We have uh, commercial and property uh, tax relief. Uh, there's also programs from the federal government, which is uh, the Canada Emergency Business Account, which is up to $60,000 in interest-free loans. We have the Canada Emergency Rent Subsidy Program. Uh, we have uh, dollars for businesses Thank to you. get online, uh, Honourable Speaker. There's so much financial support available, and we're happy if the members are not able to Thank you, Minister. To provide the supports. Member for Vancouver, Langara. Well, Mr. Speaker, the Minister simply continues to be wrong. He's continuing to mislead this province. BC doesn't have the highest support. We are actually number eight per capita when it comes to direct supports for business. Let's take live event businesses. They aren't the only group that being shunned by the Premier. Travel agents have also been excluded. One has written to us and he says, quote, things are about as bad as they could be right now, and we really need the help, end quote. You would think nobody is more affected by travel restrictions than travel agents, but they don't qualify. Will the Premier fix the circuit breaker grant so that travel agents can apply. Minister of Jobs and Economic Recovery. Uh, thank you, Honourable Speaker. Again, we are very proud of the highest per capita supports in the, in this country for people and businesses. Uh, and uh, and the member should know. In fact, I'm surprised that the member doesn't know that uh, tourism operators are uh, eligible to apply for up to $45,000 in, uh, in programming that is not uh, have to be paid back. In fact, 45,000 is the highest in the country. Uh, and I know that they can do the three times math to compare it to Ontario and they'll see that our program is significantly larger for tourism operators. And so uh, again, if the member and his colleagues uh, don't know quite how to navigate uh, to apply for a small business recovery grant program, we're certainly happy to uh, provide that support in our uh, ministry. Member for Abbotsford South. Thank you, Honorable Speaker. And the minister can repeat out of date stats all he wants, but he's just incorrect. We are not the highest. This province is among the lowest for getting money out the door. And worse than that, worse than that, barely half of the allocated funds in BC have actually been paid out thus far. This minister and this premier continue to bungle COVID supports. The Royal Canadian Legion has written to the province. They have been directly affected by the circuit breaker health order, but have been excluded from the Circuit Breaker Grant. Veterans who have given and continue to give, it's astounding, shameful and cruel that the Premier would punish veterans and exclude them from the pandemic supports. Question to the Premier. Will the Premier change his mind and stop excluding the Legion from pandemic aid today? Minister of Jobs and Economic Recovery. 
thank you, uh, Speaker. And uh, there's not many people uh, in this province that are as proud as being a Legion member as the Premier. Uh, he's a proud member of his local Legion. Uh, we, everybody in this house, are proud of our veterans and, and, and their service. My grandfather was a veteran. Uh, he was a member. Uh, and so I, I don't think that the member should be implying that somebody is more patriotic and more proud of their Legion than others. I think that it uh, does a disservice to everybody in this in this chamber. The legions do have access to the Canada Emergency Business Loan Program, which is sixty thousand uh, dollars interest free. They do have access to the rent subsidy program, which again is available to them. They do have uh, uh, um, access to the wage subsidy program as well. And so, uh, honourable speaker, uh, to suggest that we are uh, not allowing the legion to get access to important services is just incorrect. There are historic amount of supports available. We're proud of that and we're gonna to continue to do more because we know more needs to be done. Member for Fraser Nicola. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. REO Rafting and Yoga Resort has been providing internationally acclaimed experiences since the 1980s. They applied for the small business grant and were rejected only because they chose to invest in their business prior to the pandemic and had a negative cash flow. They say, I quote, the grant's criteria demonstrates a profound ignorance of how the adventure and seasonal tourism industry works, end quote. Seasonal tourism businesses continue to be left behind by this premier. Will the Premier fix his bungled grant program? Minister of Jobs, Economic Recovery and Innovations. Uh, thank you, Honourable Speaker. <clears throat> and the, the member is again incorrect. Seasonal uh, based tourism operators have been receiving uh, the Small and Business Recovery Grant Program. Um, and many of them have also received money for Launch Online, which we're very proud of. I know that the uh, opposition thought that program wasn't needed, uh, but that program has been huge for tourism operators, which have been able to now set up online presence, set up their e commerce so that they can uh, attract customers from a broader audience. And and streamline their business operations. Many tourism operators also applied and received dollars for the digital bootcamp, Honorable Speaker, which provides businesses the opportunity to learn about how to set up an online uh, uh, um, uh, operations. In fact, many tourism operators, and I can uh, share many examples, but we're running out of time, have actually pivoted to brand new business opportunities. So again, our speaker, we're very proud of our historic supports. We're very proud that we're at 99.1% of pre-pandemic job levels, the highest in the country. We continue to lead the country and we will continue to lead the country in our economic recovery as we go forward. The bell ends the question period. Attorney General. Uh, thank you, Honourable Speaker. I, I have the honour to present the Crown Proceeding Act report for the fiscal year ended March 31st, 2020. Yes. Member for Burnby North. Mr. Speaker, I have the honour to present the report of the Special Committee to appoint an Ombudsperson. I move that the report be taken as read and received. Members, those who are participating remotely have your voting cards ready, please. You heard the question. All those in favor indicate aye. Aye. Opposed? Motion carried. Member. Uh, Mr. Speaker, I ask leave of the House to move a motion to adopt the report. Members, again, you heard the motion. All those who, if anyone is against the, uh, asking for the leave, indicate. Member, continue. Leave is granted. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I move that the report be adopted, and in doing so, I would like to make some brief comments. This report constitutes the committee's unanimous recommendation that James Michael J. Chalk, QC, British Columbia's Ombudsperson since 2015 be appointed for a second six-year term after his current term ends on July 1st. The committee had extensive discussions on the Ombudsperson's evolving responsibilities and the profile and key competencies required for the position. In March, Mr. Chalk formally advised the committee of his interest in appointment for a further term of six years. 
After a detailed examination of Mr. Chalk's qualifications and experience, the committee interviewed Mr. Chalk and considered his leadership and management abilities and his work in building public confidence in the work of the office and citizen services. Committee members were impressed by Mr. Chalk's track record of senior executive leadership, his high standards of administrative fairness, his vision for improving the work of the office, and his strong commitment to Indigenous reconciliation and engagement with the province's diverse populations. Members recognized Mr. Chalk's particular achievement in leading the office's investigation of the 2012 Ministry of Health employee terminations. After receiving over 4 million records and interviewing 130 witnesses, the office submitted its 2017 report to the Legislative Assembly with a key recommendation that legislation be enacted to enable public sector whistleblowers to make their disclosures and to ensure that any resulting investigations are conducted in a fair manner. The Public Interest Disclosure Act was subsequently adopted by the Legislative Assembly in 2018, which included a central role for the office. All committee members concluded that Mr. Chalk's experience, his demonstrated achievements in carrying out the roles and responsibilities of Ombudsperson and his public sector leadership resulted in their full confidence that he be appointed as Ombudsperson for a further term of six years. Mr. Chalk is present in the gallery today and I would like to welcome him on behalf of all members of the House. I extend my sincere appreciation to the Deputy Chair and the, mem the member for Abbotsford South and to all committee members for their diligent and thoughtful consideration in reaching a unanimous recommendation on this important appointment. I would also like to thank the Clerk of the Legislative Assembly and the Clerk of Committees for their guidance in procedural matters. Thank you. Member for Abbotsford South. Thank you very much, Honourable Speaker. Um, I would like to congratulate uh, Mr. Chalk on his, on his position and thank him for accepting uh, for the next six years and to continue the fine work that he's done. I would be remiss, Mr. Speaker, if I did not take a moment to thank staff. Staff showed this committee uh, great guidance and were um, absolutely on top of their game, Mr. Speaker. So I, I, from my heart, I want to thank staff from the foremost. I'd also like to say, Mr. Speaker, what a pleasure it was to be part of this committee. Um, it was mentioned at the end, Mr. Speaker, that how much the committee members enjoyed one another's company and how we banded together to do what was right for the province by the citizens of this province. It was not political at all, Mr. Speaker. It is as it should be. So my congratulations to Mr. Chalk, my thanks to staff, and my thanks and congratulations to the members that were served on this committee. This House can be very proud. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Members, a vote is about to take place. Those who are participating remotely have your voting cards ready. All those in favor indicate aye. aye. Those who oppose indicate nay. Motion carried. Uh, Burnaby North. Uh, I ask leave of the House to move a motion recommending that the Lieutenant Governor appoint James Michael Chalk as Ombudsperson. Members, a request has been made for leave. Is leave granted? Aye. Thank you. Member. I move that the Legislative Assembly recommend to her honour the Lieutenant Governor that James Michael Chalk, QC, be appointed as an officer of the Legislature to exercise the powers and duties assigned to the Ombudsperson for the Province of British Columbia for a six-year term commencing July 1st, 2021, pursuant to the Ombudsperson Act. Members, you heard the motion. All those in favour indicate aye. 
Those who opposed indicate nay. Motion carried. Thank you, member. <laughs> Madam Clerk. Orders of the day. Government House Leader. Uh, thank you, uh, Honourable Speaker. In this chamber, I call uh, Committee Stage uh, Bill 13, Employment Standards Amendment Act. And in the uh, Section 8 Douglas Fir Room, I call uh, Estimates Debate for the Ministry of Indigenous Relations and Reconciliation. Committee Chair. All right, members, I would like to call the committee to order. We are here, of course, for Bill 13, the Employment Standards Amendment Act Number 2, 2021, on Clause 1. Uh, does the minister want to make any? No. Nope. Uh, shall Clause 1, uh, member for Shushwap on Clause 1. Uh, thank you very much, uh, uh, Mr. Chair. Uh, Great uh, privilege to stand in the House today uh, to follow up through some detailed questions uh, with respect to, to Bill 13. And uh, just as we start uh, uh, with respect to the amount of work that was undertaken uh, in the preparation of Bill 13, uh, through you, Mr. Chair, uh, to the Minister, if I could just uh, request uh, when specifically uh, did government undertake the initiative of uh, the work uh, related to the presentation of the bill that's before us today. Minister of Labour. Thank you, uh, Honourable Speaker. Um, as we know, when pandemic hit us, February, March last year, and uh, it brought to the surface uh, many of the uh, gaps that existed for workers' support, uh, especially when they're sick, especially when pandemic hit us. And uh, so we realized at that time that uh, workers did not have right to, to sick leave. Uh, if they were sick with COVID, they would, uh, if they need to take time off, they, were, they didn't have right to take their time off without risking their job. 
So we fix that through uh, legislative changes, regulation changes. And then we also realize that uh, the workers at workplaces uh, could be uh, getting sick with COVID. And, and if they apply for WorkSafe, apply, file a claim, and it takes days sometimes, uh, and it takes time for the claim to process, to determine whether it's a work-related or not, we fix that. And we work with WorkSafe BC, and we fast-tracked the presumption clause uh, of that required 90 days waiting after WorkSafe BC decides that they wanted to uh, provide a presumption protection to the workers in that situation. We did that. So we've been working to protect the workers and to fix the gaps all along. And as the member will know, then we were working uh, to see uh, when, the, when the vaccination program started, and there were workers in a situation where they may not have time uh, outside of the working hours to go get vaccinated, and that they need time off during the work. So we fixed that. But Mr. Speaker, that wasn't the only thing we were doing. On parallel to that, we were working with the federal government. As the Premier said, last summer, we've been working at this since about a year ago, last summer, that uh, we believe it is a national emergency and we need a national solution. We knew that the workers who are sick at workplace should be able to stay home without loss of pay. And federal government listened and they brought in their federal program. Mr. Speaker, we realized that there were gaps in that program. So we went back to the, the federal government. I think premiers all across this country realized there should be a national solution. And uh, the federal government delivered, but, but left few gaps. So they listened and they extended from two weeks to four weeks coverage. But, but the initial one or two days for you to qualify for that particular week, you must lose over 50% of work or, or income. And that gap remained. And then if you qualify, then $500 is less than minimum wage. The best solution would have been that we were working with the federal government. We had some indication that they would be looking into it and provide some protection to it. And uh, uh, looking at uh, how can that be fixed. They came back, we found out two weeks ago after they delivered their budget, that they weren't able to fix it. We didn't stop there, we continued to talk to them. We had some indication they might be able to do it. We, but then, then they told us that we could not top up the $500 without clawback. And so the, the initial one day, two days, was the issue then for us to fix. So we are fixing it with, with this bill. So we've been working at fixing the gaps that existed for workers' support who are sick and who are not able to stay home without loss of pay. So we were working with the federal government, we brought our own programs in place, and, and, and now, what, what two weeks ago when we realized that the federal government wasn't able to fix those gaps, so we started working quickly to, to put this bill together, that it is up to us now that we need to fix it. So that's why we're here today. Member. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair, and thanks, Minister, uh, for the, hi the history with respect to how we've arrived at this point. Uh, through you, Mr. Speaker, uh, or sorry, Mr. Chair, uh, through to the Minister, uh, can the Minister provide specificity upon the date that the federal program was initially announced and when the BC government identified that a gap existed?
Minister. Thank you, Honorable Chair. Um, I think the federal um, CRSP program was announced uh, September 2020. Um, and uh, so we right away identified those gaps. And uh, we started to work with federal government. The premier took the charge, my colleagues in finance and, and myself, March 1st this year, had uh, meetings with, uh, with other uh, ministers of labor from other jurisdictions, uh, by the federal minister of labor. It brought to their attention at that time too that uh, those gaps still exist. And we had the indication that they might be looking at fixing those gaps. All along, we thought that there would be something coming to fix those gaps. $500, can the provinces top up? I mean, just, you know, member would know, Mr. Speaker, Ontario was trying to do the same thing. They uh, asked the federal government that if they could top up, federal government could top up, and the province will pay the federal government, and the federal government said no to it. And we said, can we top up? And, and, you know, so we had some indications that there may be a model that they could work with us, that they may be able to uh, fix those gaps that we were, we were identifying, a different way to deal with it, uh, fix the initial one or two days issue, and also is there a way that we could top up the $500 without clawback. Uh, the answer came back. Uh, even after the budget was delivered two weeks ago, we, we, we continued to work with them. My colleague in finance to finance, they were working at it. And uh, we had some indications that they might be able to fix it. Uh, they might be able to come up with a, with a solution that can be used as a model for other provinces. But then we realized, and they came back to us, no, they can't do it. And uh, so then we were you know, on our own to make sure that we come up with a made in BC solution to fix those gaps. And that's why this uh, bill is here. Member. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, through you uh, to the minister, uh, if the minister could also maybe just provide a bit of clarity for this house, uh, when it was first understood or acknowledged by government uh, that there was considerable risk uh, for workers that did not have access to paid leave uh, in the province. Minister. Thank you, uh, Honorable Chair. Uh, if I understood the question correctly, I think the question was, when did we realize that workers in BC have no paid sick leave? Maybe the member could clarify, he said no. Member. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Yeah, no, the, uh, the question was, uh, when was it uh, that government actually acknowledged or came to the understanding that workers that do not have a paid sick leave program are at increased risk of, uh, of actually uh, uh, of obtaining uh, the COVID virus. So uh, the minister has indicated obviously the purpose of this bill is to provide paid sick leave so that workers that are ill or otherwise uh, uh, not able to go to work, that they are entitled to 
paid leave under, under this bill. Uh, the question is that obviously this bill is satisfying a risk. And so the question uh, through you, uh, Mr. Chair, to the minister is that when did government uh, come to the realization that workers that currently do not have a paid sick leave program were at, at increased risk of receiving COVID in the workplace and then also the potential for workers that obtain that uh, virus taking it back to their families? Minister. Thank you, Honorable uh, Chair. Look, when pandemic hit us, no one knew what kind of virus is this, how it's going to hit us. Um, different countries took different approaches, uh, different provinces took different approaches in order to uh, overcome this, the, the spread of, of a virus. It was changing. And uh, uh, sometime last year, um, as we move forward, uh, we want to make sure we want to make sure that the economy, as much as we could keep running, uh, we, you know, in, prob in the province of British Columbia, we we decided that that's that's the best way to uh, keep people working and uh, keep the economy going. And then at, at the same time, we we realized that uh, uh, there were workers uh, who maybe uh, are spreading COVID. Uh, uh, at workplaces, um, because um, there were some places, some uh, factories and operations were being shut down all across the country, and uh, so you need to put some some measures in. Uh, that's why the works at BC work with all different sectors. Thirty-two different sectors, the works at BC put together uh, uh, safety protocols for them, safety plans for them, and within each sector. Individual businesses were to draft up their own safety plans and to make sure that we stop the transmission or minimize the transmission at workplaces. And uh, so that's, that's, it just, it just evolved on every day. And uh, then, uh, then I think it was, uh, uh, you know, uh, it was understood that if workers uh, need to take time off, then they could stay home. Uh, that is the best way of stopping transmission at workplaces. That's why we made all those changes, to make sure that they have job protector leave. If they need to stay home, there's a job protector leave provision there. And if they catch, becomes, become ill at workplace, that they would, uh, uh, their claims will be uh, accepted uh, on a presumptive basis. We made those changes. And, uh, and then the other thing was, in order to stop the transmission at workplaces, was to make sure that everyone is vaccinated. And we made that easier and, and remove some of those roadblocks. So I think we've been working all along to ensure that the workplaces can continue to operate safely, that the workplaces are safe, and all those measures were, were, were put in place to stop the transmission at workplaces. Member. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and thank you, Minister, uh, for the information. Um, if we go back, to the outset of the pandemic, 
uh, our chief medical health officer, uh, had lots to say to British Columbians about the potential risk. Uh, we knew that uh, with the virus, uh, quite often some of the symptoms, the loss of smell, loss of taste, uh, increased temperature and fever, there was many uh, different uh, signs that individuals may have COVID. And, and I appreciate that a significant amount of work was undertaken by WorkSafe BC to establish some protocols uh, with respect to uh, providing worker protection. And I believe it was also the health officer that uh, came out and told British Columbians, uh, for the most part, if you're feeling unwell, stay home. Don't go to work. Businesses made significant effort, efforts to try and undertake the opportunity for workers uh, that had the ability potentially to work from home. Um, but if we go back to the time uh, when it was certainly made apparent uh, by our chief medical officer and also uh, some of the undertaking in the work of WorkSafe BC with respect to protocols, I know even in this legislature, every morning when we arrive in this place, uh, we have to actually answer a series of questions. Have we been ill? Have we been unwell? Do we have a fever? There's many different checks that are undertaken, and if we answer yes to any of those questions, we are encouraged, even here at this legislature, to stay home. So there was a point in time uh, when government was fully aware of the potential risks of transmission uh, of COVID, bring it to the workplace. And uh, so my question to you, Mr. Chair, to the minister, is that at what point in time uh, is he able to confirm to this House when government was aware of the potential risk of the transfer or transmission of COVID in the workplace, uh, which obviously directed much of the work uh, that WorkSafe BC did uh, last spring. Thank you. Minister of Labour. Thank you, Honourable Chair. Um, look, as a member will know that uh, we put together an uh, economic uh, recovery task force. Uh, Premier did uh, with the Finance Minister. We met with them on a regular basis. And there was a, there was a, um, a little anxiety um, by the employers group that uh, this is a national emergency and there need to be a, a, some kind of a national solution. And they were worried that workers coming to work, spreading uh, the COVID, and other people getting ill and, and operations getting shut down, and that, that they shouldn't be asked to uh, carry the burden either. So they 
themselves, along with the Premier, reached out to the, uh, to the federal government and the Prime Minister. They wrote a letter that there need to be a national solution to it. And that's exactly, so what we could do on a, on a parallel side here, we were doing everything that we could to protect those workers, to give them right to take time off with a job protected leave. And WCV changes, as I mentioned before. And then work with the, with the business group to work with the federal government to come up with a national program. So September last year, as a result of those efforts by businesses, by the premier, and some other premiers also, federal government announced that program that we talked about earlier. Uh, and so we thought that would fix it because they were, they were talking to us, we were talking to them, that there would be a, a national solution coming. So, and, and when, when the program was announced, we identified gaps. And we went back to them, and they listened. We went back to them. They listened. They fixed it to an extent uh, by extending two weeks to four weeks. But the, the initial two, two days, as I said, two and a half days, or the $500, they didn't fix. So we continued to work with them. And I explained that in my previous answer. Right till the end, we had some indications. Ontario tried. They didn't agree with them. Then we proposed a different proposal, a different model. They were open to that. And right up until you know, we finally made a decision to, to draft our own bill, our finance minister and, and her ministry was, was working with the federal finance minister and their ministry. Other ministers were involved, trying to come up with a model that would fix this national solution. And then we got the answer that uh, uh, they couldn't do it. And uh, so therefore, we were, we were uh, forced to, to you know, come up with our own solution. Made in BC, as Premier said, they don't do it, we would do it. So here we are. Member. Uh, Mr. Chair, uh, and I, I appreciate the, uh, the additional information from the Minister. However, uh, maybe I'll, I'll rephrase the question. So what I'm trying to determine is identify is when government became aware that there was uh, increased potential uh, risk for workers uh, for COVID transmission in the workplace. And, and maybe I'll, I'll phrase the question this way. Can the Minister share with this House when WorkSafe BC established the guidelines specifically requiring workers that were feeling unwell to stay home and their, um, their request for workers not to come to work uh, when they were feeling unwell? Minister. Honourable Chair, thank you. Um, it wasn't uh, works at BC's directive, uh, when you're sick, don't come to work. It was the PHO, Provincial Health Officer. And they were saying, stay home when you're sick. And that's been the direct right from the beginning. The best way to stop the transmission of COVID is stay home. Don't travel. Uh, don't meet people. Uh, don't shake hands. Wash hands. And, uh, and uh, so that's, you keep six, feet, you know, uh, two meter apart when you're shopping, when you're out, if you have to go out. Those are the director from the PHO. Now, at workplaces, uh, there were some jurisdictional issues. Uh, provincial health officers orders whether uh, WorkSafe BC can, can enforce them. Uh, so that, the, initially there was that question as well. So PHO and WorkSafe BC worked together uh, so that, uh, num number one, that the safety plans for each operation must be there. And, uh, and it was provincial health officer's directive. And then works at BC uh, help put those safety plans together. And uh, so then they work, worked out uh, uh, an arrangement where works at BC would be helping provincial health officer uh, orders to, to enforce at workplaces. So I think all those things were happening. So also to clarify to the member 
The, uh, the businesses wrote that letter, I'm advised, May 13th last year. Almost, you know, uh, urging, urging, urging to the federal government, you know, come up with a national solution. Our, prime minister, our premier was, was also urging the, prime, you know, the federal government because these discussions took place during our uh, economic recovery task force meetings, uh, you know, uh, quite often. And, uh, and so, so, you know, so they together lobbied the federal government. Federal government listened. And, uh, uh, and then they came up uh, with the, with the uh, federal sick, sick program. And, you know, obviously, as we <clears throat> mentioned before, there were flaws in it. And we've been working with them uh, all along to make sure to fix those flaws. They, they came some, somewhat, uh, some way. Um, but then the other couple of areas, they tried, they said. Um, but, you know, even with the Ontario, uh, I said, you know, other provinces tried. They didn't, didn't work out. And so um, we were ready to go if they, we, we got the answer from, from the federal government that they were not going to uh, cooperate with us or work with us and, and fix those gaps. Member. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, so what I'm trying to establish, uh, and, and maybe, maybe the minister might be able to provide uh, this clarity, the minister referenced in his answer uh, that on the direction of PHO, the public health officer, uh, WorkSafe BC undertook to establish some safety guidelines. And, and, and I do... Uh, understand that those health guidelines specifically gave reference uh, to workers or encouraging workers to stay home uh, if they were feeling unwell. So the minister might be able to provide some clarity. And what date uh, was it that Works, WorkSafe BC initially provided um, the uh, safety plan guidelines that were provided to businesses all across the province as far as some of the best uh, efforts that they might undertake uh, in order to prevent the transfer of COVID in the workplace. Minister. Honorable Chair, thank you. Um, WorkSafe BC, um, on the advice of CDC, posted on their website on March 12th uh, advice of, to workers to stay home if you're sick. But then they, they work with the provincial health officer to come up with the safety plans. And those safety plans were announced uh, when the province uh, announced reopening certain parts of the, of the province and the, and the industry in the sectors it was May 6th. Member. Uh, thank you very much. I, I, I appreciate uh, that. So, uh, as ministers confirmed, March 12th uh, was it the, the date that uh, WorkSafe BC, I guess, through their website, initiated uh, the request that uh, workers were feeling unwell to stay home and not come to work, but it was a little while later, uh, May 6th uh, was the date uh, that the actual uh, WorkSafe BC provided the safety plans and the guidelines and best practices for businesses to follow. So it's apparent that uh, as early as March of last year, and certainly by May 6th, uh, when the economy started to open up again, uh, government was aware of the potential risk for workers for the transmission of COVID in the workplace. Um, and so through you, Mr. Chair, uh, to the minister, I'm just wondering, uh, can the minister share 
in the middle of a health pandemic, a global pandemic, the single largest health crisis that we have faced in British Columbia uh, in over 100 years, uh, they had the financial resources with the $5 billion COVID uh, spending plan that was approved by all members of the legislature. Uh, why is it that government waited until this week, over a year later, before tabling this piece of legislation? Minister. Thank you, uh, Honourable Chair. Um, you know, we need to remember um, March was pretty, you know, to, to, to think about it, it was the front end of the pandemic. And everyone was trying to figure out how to deal with this. And Works at BC as their role to protect workers at workplaces and their health and safety at workplaces, working with the employers to ensure that their workplaces are safe, they posted that uh, March 12th. So they were very proactive, in my view, and uh, advised um, the employers and the workers to stay home if they're sick, uh, on the advice of CDC. Um, and, uh, and then we, the province and, the, and, the, and the, the businesses and the labor were working together through that task force. How do we reopen? You know, you, you know that there were, member would know there were stages of, of reopening of the economy. And um, May 6th, uh, safety plans were announced by Works at BC because that's the time we were reopening the, the, the economy. Uh, 32 sector specific. And in the meantime, at the same time, May 6th is, is when we reopen the economy. May 13th, uh, I mean, the discussion took place prior to that, but, but finally, May 13th, the businesses wrote a letter to the Prime Minister uh, that it's not, it should not be up to the province uh, because they were worried about the cost to them and they were worried about the cost to the province. There's a national emergency and should be dealt with as a national solution. So they wrote, our premier wrote, that look, we need that program now. And they listened. Took some time, but September they announced their program. Yeah, you could say that, you know, they took longer. But they were working with us, we were working with them. Businesses, the government, the labor, they were all saying to the federal government, it's, it's, it needs national solution. And they delivered. And I just said that before, and I, I think my answer, uh, I had repeated many times, uh, there were flaws, uh, there were gaps in it. They fixed one gap by extending two weeks to four weeks, but other two remained. We continued to work with them. We had the indication that, yeah, you know, maybe there's a, there's a solution to it. Uh, different kind of models have been being considered. Uh, and then the third wave starts. You know, people are starting to, to realize that we need to you know, take extra steps. Uh, we're again working with the federal government that we need some solutions here. Uh, there were indications there could be some, some different, you know, ways to, to resolve this problem working with the provinces. Uh, and then uh, we saw in, in their budget there was no mention. Then we got on the phone again. My colleagues got on the phone again. Uh, they said no to Ontario first because that was a different model being looked at. And we said, well, you know, there's a, maybe a different model that we could look at. And, and you know, by provinces topping up rather than federal government topping up and then, then the reimbursement by the provinces. If that doesn't work, you know, what about our model? And also, how do we fix the, the first two and a half days? Uh, there was indication that there may be an opportunity to come up with a new model that could be used across the country. And then finally they came back 
they, uh, they're not able to, 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 to deal with those issues. So then we quickly had to put together uh, our own uh, uh, solutions and, uh, and that's what exactly this bill will do. It, it fixed that gap, the two days or two and a half days that the worker, if they lose, uh, they weren't entitled to any benefit from the federal program in that particular week. This program will ensure that if the worker wakes up in the morning, feels sick, feverish, cough, show those signs, that worker can stay home, has the ability to stay home now, knowing that they will not lose any income. That's what the purpose of this short-term solution that we are proposing during the pandemic, which will take us till the end of this year. And yes, we also understand that the many businesses are struggling to survive, as the member and other members of this house have canvassed uh, uh, so many times in this house. So we want to make sure that they don't, they're not asked to carry the whole burden of, 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 of dealing with this issue. But employers understand that it is in their best interest to make sure that the workers who are sick say stay home. Because we have seen, if they don't, over 70 plus businesses had to be shut down because of COVID cluster in those operations in the last few weeks. And then the loss is a lot bigger, a lot bigger. And uh, so, so having, having a program that, 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 the, that the businesses understand that if we are allowed to, uh, to, uh, to, to our, our workers to stay home if they're sick, uh, without loss of pay, it benefit them, it benefit the workers. And, uh, but we understand um, that the businesses are hurting as well. So we said we would uh, reimburse uh, those employers who allow their, their, their workers to stay home who are, who are sick up to $200 uh, per, uh, per worker per day. Uh, so I think it's a win-win situation. Member. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair, and, uh, and I do appreciate the Minister for the additional clarity. I do have some additional questions with respect to timelines, but at, at this point, uh, I'd like to actually turn this over uh, to my colleague, uh, the leader of the official Green Party. Thank you. Recognizing the leader of the third party. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and thank you to the member for Shuswap and the Minister. I've been enjoying this, uh, this conversation quite a bit. I'm a historian, so I've been making a timeline. I'm just trying to understand all the things that have been happening since March of 2020. So the minister has indicated uh, May 6th of 2020 was when the work safe safety plans uh, were brought forward, an indication that everybody was understanding the risk of COVID in workplace and the risk of infection being transmitted in workplaces. Uh, the minister indicated that there was work being done to uh, encourage the federal government to put out a sick pay program, which they did February 20, uh, sorry, September 2020, um, and that that program had gaps. And then there was further work, further conversations between provincial ministers and federal minister about addressing those gaps. Uh, minister for Labor has indicated one of those gaps was addressed. And then eight months, went by and we find ourselves with a bill for sick pay in British Columbia, which covers three days for an employee. And so the minister in his response just now said that this bill will ensure that a worker can stay home knowing they, they will not lose any income for three days. And we know that the gaps in the federal program still remain. They have to, the program Reply, uh, requires application retroactively. It's not funds that can be provided immediately. So people who are living paycheck to paycheck, uh, the federal program really doesn't meet their immediate needs and it pays less than minimum wage. And so workers can stay home knowing they will have income for three days. And then beyond that, that they can apply to the federal program, which we have universally agreed uh, has gaps. Between September 2020 and May 2021, we have gone through the second wave 
of COVID, and we have gone through the third wave of COVID. And those waves have been increasingly devastating in terms of the cost to people's health and to people's lives in this province and across the country. And so these ongoing conversations between the provincial ministers and the federal minister seem a little leisurely given what was unfolding in people's lives between March 2020 and May 2021. My question for the minister, given all that we know about the gaps in the federal program and about the realities for workers in this province for whom three days, if you're tested positive for COVID-19, is neither sufficient for recovery, nor is it sufficient to protect public health because the people are being faced with the same choice, which is, do I stay home, protect my health, protect the health of the, my colleagues, and protect public health at the cost of not being able to pay my bills because it takes longer than three days to recover from this illness. So does the minister think that this bill is sufficient to address the immediate needs of workers in BC today? Minister of Labour. Thank you, Honourable Chair. Um, um, I think uh, the member knows um, the federal government, when they came up with that program, they set aside about $2.4 billion for that program. Up until now, they have utilized about $454 million, $454,000 million. So $454 uh, million, okay? So, there's a lot of space there. They have the capacity, and we were given the indication that we would fix it. Now, the best solution was that our bill, you know, three days, plus if we were able to top up. But they would not allow us to top up without clawback. So, so you know, we, right along, we were not sitting idly by. I listed a whole you know, number of different things that we were doing to support the workers and the businesses uh, as soon as the pandemic hit us. Uh, first priority was the health of our population. And then was to make sure that the workplaces are safe, those who are operating, uh, the essential services. And we work with the, with the employers, work with the workers, their representatives, to ensure that, uh, that uh, workplaces are safe. Uh, and if the, and there was enforcement. I can tell you the, the number of inspection by WCB uh, during the pandemic are, are enormous numbers in addition to their normal work and normal inspections. It was not just to establish the safety plans and then leave it to somebody else to, 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 uh, to self-discipline uh, uh, it. But, but no, it was, it was to enforce, make sure that the workplaces are safe. Now, to the, to the real question that the member was asking, is this sufficient? We believe it is sufficient answer to the gaps that, that exist. Remember, this is the, 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 the first three days uh, for, for, uh, for, for worker to, to make sure that they are, they are fully paid. Because if you work three days, then you, on Thursday, uh, you feel sick, and, and, or you go for a test. So Thursday, Friday, you're waiting for the result. These three days will fix that. They will, they will not lose any money before they would have lost that, those two days. And then they would go on a federal program. Now, 
we could have top up, which we offer to the federal government. Once they go on the federal program, initial three days are covered, they go on the federal program, then we would top up. They would not allow us with their clawback. So we had to do what's the best that we could do here. And I think this is a sufficient bill. It is a balanced approach. The workers will be able to stay home knowing that they will, their, their, their wages will, will, will continue on uh, for, the, for the three days, and then they could go on a, on a uh, uh, program for the, from the federal government if they need longer time off. Uh, also, the 50% of the workers who don't have any sick plan at our workplaces today, uh, many of them are low wages, non-union sector mostly. Collective, many collective agreements, public sector, they already have sick leave plans. And so it is to deal with, with those workers who are at the lower end of the wages, non-union workers, and uh, you know, their, their, their wages will be protected and they know if they need to take time off because they're sick on, on one day, two days, three days, that their wages will continue on. And we will support the, the employer uh, so that they, they don't carry the, the entire burden of, the, of the, this program either. Leader, third party. Uh, thank you. I, I, are we, I will ask one quick question, and I assume we will be resuming this. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I appreciate the response from the minister and that he believes that this is sufficient as it stands. I just want to walk through what that would mean for somebody. So uh, as a person earning um, close to minimum wage, maybe just above minimum wage, uh, indicating that your expenses every month are pretty much what your entire paycheck is going to cover. So you are there, and we know in, in British Columbia there are far too many people who are living at that precarious place where one missed paycheck is catastrophic. It can mean losing housing, it can mean not eating or having food for your kids, it can mean catastrophic consequences. So that person tests positive for COVID-19, has three days covered by this provincial program, then has to apply to the federal program, which provides less than minimum wage, which means they are actually going to earn less in, in that segment, those two weeks. is 10 days minimum is the infectious period. This is what we've heard from the health officer. Do not go out, do not spend time in your workplace. So now they are actually having a diminished income, having already existed right at that precarious edge. Does the minister really think that that is sufficient for some of the most marginal workers in British Columbia who have suffered the most in this pandemic? Minister of Labor. Thank you, uh, Honorable Chair. I think, uh, Member, I, uh, the scenario that you put together, uh, the plight of minimum wage workers in, in this province, in this country, is real. Uh, right now we're talking about pandemic and to ensure that the workers have the ability to stay home when they're sick so that transmission of workplaces is, is, uh, is stopped. But, but, but that goes, that situation exists forever. Those workers who you know, have worked long enough, if they become ill at workplace or, or they become ill, what right do they have? They go on federal sick benefit program, EI sick benefit program, which pays again less than their wages. 
So, I mean, you know, we could talk about, and I think we would probably share the value of plight of lowest paid workers in this province and what, you know, what are their, what are they're, they're facing when, when they lose one day, two days, or lose their job altogether. That situation is real. And, and I think today we're talking about pandemic, during pandemic, how do we support these workers uh, so that they uh, don't lose money when they wake up in the morning that they need to take that day off. So they will be covered with this bill. And then they would go on uh, to, uh, to the federal program. Uh, my suggestion is that our bill is designed to work in collaboration with other support systems that, that are in place, especially the federal program. Now, had they allowed us, as I said before, had they allowed us to top up the $500 without clawback, that would have been the answer, but they would not allow us to do that. Minister, Minister so we did everything we could to fix the gap mm -hmm. and so that we could move on and, and provide the, the, the support to those workers at least for the, those three days, and then they could go on the federal program. Um, Honorable Chair, uh, noting the hour, I call. You, you move to report progress. You, uh, you, you, I move you, report you, uh, progress you, uh, you, uh, and ask to sit again. Uh, well, well, we'll get there in a moment, but uh, honorable members, uh, you've heard the motion. We're going to adjourn, I think, is uh, the, the request here, uh, this debate uh, for now, and we will come back when we get that opportunity. So uh, all those in favor, please indicate. Are you in favor of adjourning the debate for now? Opposed? Okay. Motion is carried. Uh, we will await the speaker who is here. Committee Chair. Committee reports progress on Bill 13 and seeks leave to sit again. When shall the committee sit again, Minister? Next sitting. So ordered. Committee Chair. Okay. Mr. Speaker, Committee of Supply, uh, Section A reports progress on the estimates of the Ministry of Indigenous Relations and Reconciliation and asks leave to sit again. When shall the committee sit again? Minister of Finance. At the next sitting. So ordered. Minister of Finance, Acting House Leader. I move the House to now adjourn. Members, you heard the motion. All those in favor indicate aye. aye. Those who oppose, motion carried. This House stands adjourned at 1.30 in this afternoon. Oh, one o'clock. one o'clock this afternoon. Absolutely. News. <laughs> yes, one o'clock.